Hola. Let's talk about Azure, big data in Azure. First, let's uh, talk about our sponsors. This event uh, has been a fantastic event for me, hopefully for you as well. I came a long way to be here, and I'm really glad I did. And I, I would like to personally thank the organizers and the sponsors for making this possible. I'd like to hear a big round of applause from you all for them. Uh, this is me. My name is David. I work for Microsoft. I am a technical evangelist. It's pretty much the best job in the world. I get to play with toys and learn how to use them and then share that knowledge with people like you. I cannot believe they pay me to do this. This is my mother. My mother passed away about a month ago. Her name was Joyce. If you will keep her and my family in your prayers, I will very much appreciate it. Today's presentation is dedicated to her. Let's talk about cloud computing. Who here is using cloud computing? Uh, most of the audience raised their hand. Um, cloud computing, I hear a lot about cloud computing. Uh, the problem I have with cloud computing is that it's become kind of a marketing buzzword. And whenever that happens, when things become really popular and the marketing people start to use that word, then it, uh, it starts to take on new meanings and everybody has their own definition. So I want to begin with my definition of cloud computing which is this, that cloud computing is when you have some third party, like Microsoft, like Microsoft Azure, host some or all of your data or your application in a highly scalable, highly reliable way. And now that's a very broad definition, and, uh, it, but it encompasses all of Microsoft Azure. All of Azure is highly scalable and it's highly reliable. And the highly reliable part of it is simple to understand. Uh, the way that Microsoft implements this is that we spent a lot of money and effort monitoring our hardware and monitoring our software and monitoring our systems and detecting when they go down. And then we have redundancy built in so that when it goes down, it can fail over to uh, another system. And that's how we implement, how Azure implements high reliability. Highly scalable is a little, I'm going to cover it in more detail, but that's a little bit more complicated. But here's the advantages of cloud computing. One is cheap, it's cheaper up front. Essentially with cloud computing, you are renting server space rather than buying server space. So if you're a startup, you don't have a lot of cash, that might make sense. Reduce your capital expenditures by renting instead of buying. Um, but it also gives you a lot of flexibility. And what I mean by that is when, you're, when you buy something, you basically have it all the time. You're paying for it all the time. You have to maintain it all the time. Uh, when you're renting it, you can choose to rent it when you want to rent it and not rent it when you don't want to rent it, rent it which, is, which is significant because you only pay for it while you rent it. Um, here's a picture of just uh, capacity in general. Uh, your, as your application is uh, running, any, it doesn't matter what kind of application it is, over time, demand for that application will change whether it's a web application or a data application or whatever, the demand for it doesn't remain constant. What happens is that sometimes demand is very high and sometimes it's very low, but if I'm, if I'm implementing my own hardware, if I'm buying my servers and maintaining myself, I have to make a decision. How much hardware do I buy? And it may, I may decide to buy, I'm gonna buy as much hardware as I expect the maximum amount that my application is going to consume. Uh, and that's not a bad way of going because then you don't miss out on any, oppor in any opportunities. However, there's a cost to that. There's a tremendous waste when we buy all this extra hardware because we have to maintain it when it's not being used. Um, we could choose, for example, to uh, buy you know, about average the amount of hardware and sort of average it out, but we'd still have some waste. And we'd, uh, more importantly, I think, uh, we'd lose some opportunity. You know, if you're a website, an e-commerce website that sold a lot of products at Christmas time, you certainly don't want to miss out on those sales at Christmas time. What you'd like to do is something like this. Every time I, uh, demand goes up, I'm going to buy some new servers and I'm going to you know, install an operating system and install my application on it, install my data on them. And then when, they, uh, when demand goes down, I'll sell them and then I'll buy them back the next day. Here I have it every month. It could be every day. It could be every hour. And so what tends to happen is that the more volatility you have in your demand, the more it makes sense financially to buy or to, to rent rather than to buy. That, that cost advantage is more pronounced if you have a lot of volatility. 
Uh, today we're talking about big data. And we, when we work with big data, that curve tends to look like this. We do a lot of work for a short period of time. We, we throw a lot of compute power at it, and then those machines will sit idle for a while. We probably want to just get rid of them and not pay for them while we're not using them. And that's, so big data is an ideal scenario for cloud computing because of the cost advantages here. And that's one of the reasons why big data, is so much, big data analysis is so much more popular today than it was just five years ago is because of the cloud. Because now, because now we can rent services on the cloud, very highly scalable services, then small companies can afford to do big data analysis. In the past, you had to have buy a lot of hardware to do that, and that was prohibitively expensive for a lot of companies. So that's why cloud computing just makes sense for big data analysis. And Azure has, uh, Microsoft Azure, which is Microsoft's cloud computing platform, uh, has a big data service. It's called HD Insight. And HD Insight is simply Hadoop and all of its tools deployed onto Azure. Now Hadoop, who here has worked with Hadoop? Uh, I only see a couple of hands going up. So if you've been working with uh, big data in the past, chances are you've worked with Hadoop. It was a very popular open source set of tools and uh, Microsoft, rather than deciding to build their own set of tools, they're deploying the Hadoop tools onto Azure, which has a couple of advantages. The advantage for Microsoft is we don't have to maintain something that's already working. We can just take it and deploy it onto our platform so that it can take advantage of the scalability and the reliability of Azure and maybe some of the ease of management features that Azure offers. Uh, but also it's advantages to you because if you're already doing big data, you don't have to relearn a new set of tools. Or if you have a company that's already doing big data, you, it's easy to find the talent that's using those tools already. You don't have to retrain your employees. You don't have to uh, hire people and retrain them on something. It's already using, the skill sets are out there. So Azure HD Insight, it's using Hadoop. It's an it's a, uh, um, open source set of tools. It's actually a framework. We're, technically, we're using the Hortonworks implementation of the Hadoop tools. And this includes things like HBase and Hive and Storm and Spark. And we're going to go into some of those in more detail during this talk. Uh, and it integrates with other tools that you probably are using if you're not doing big data, things like Excel or SQL Server Reporting Services or Analysis Services or Power BI, things like that, all of which are very popular tools. And um, they, they hook in really well with HD Insight and with Hadoop. Now, um, the big thing that Azure offers to this is the scalability because it takes a lot of... Uh, Processing power to, to analyze big data. Usually one server isn't enough to do it. It would take a long time to process, you know, we're talking about terabytes, petabytes of data. Um, it takes a long time to do that. So what you can do is Hadoop allows you to run s these uh, processes in parallel on multiple machines within a cluster. And what Azure does is it allows it, it makes it easy to create these clusters. So you can get that high scalability. Uh, and also the high reliability as well. Um, when I talk about clusters, what I mean is, is I drew a little picture of this, so I'm going to show it. It's, uh, if we have a process that's running on multiple machines simultaneously, it'll just go a lot faster. So in this case, I've got, what, five machines, and uh, that would run about five times as fast as running on one machine. It's not exactly linear because there's some overhead to distribute the workload, but you, tend, you can take advantage of lots of machines, rent them while you're using it. And with, with HD Insight, one nice thing about it is if five machines aren't enough and you decide I need to add a couple of more machines to this cluster because the job that I'm running today is going to be a lot bigger, you can do that on the fly. You don't have to recreate the cluster. You can just add machines to it automatically. And the other nice thing about HD Insight is when you're done with these machines, you can delete them and not lose the data and not lose the configuration because the data and the configuration are all store, stored in Azure storage. And uh, there we go, there's some Azure blob storage so that if you delete them, which you probably should do because they do cost money while they exist, uh, and then recreate them the next time you want to run a job, you could pull all that configuration and all that data out of blob storage and get the same cluster recreated back again with the same configuration. Um, HD Insight uses something called a Lambda architecture, which is part of the reason why it's so fast. Uh, it uses uh, this is a batch layer, speed layer, and serving layer. These are, uh, the batch layer is the pre-computed results. These are data stored on disks with um, uh, some 
pre-computed aggregation. Now, now there's some latency involved in doing this because we have to store the data disk and we have to do some calculations on that. So that's, that's not as fast, but it tends to be more accurate, more persistent, more reliable. But it combines it with a speed layer and the speed layer allows you to query data as it's coming in, even before it's written to disk. So you, before you store it in a database, just come in, you can run queries against it. And it's smart enough to um, uh, know the difference, to, to combine the two, to use whatever's, if it's on disk, let's use that. If it uh, hasn't been written to disk, let's use the speed layer. And these are, uh, Apache Storm is a good example of using this. And then the serving layer allows you to create uh, some pre-computed views and queries um, to use for, as part of your business intelligence processing. So all these together make HD Insight a really powerful platform. Um, these are some of the tools that are available. Hadoop, HBase, Storm, Spark. This list is growing all the time. Um, when we create clusters, we're going to specify what kind of cluster it is. And I'll just talk about each one of these in, in individually. But this is, creating cluster is very simple in Azure HD Insight. All you do is there's a big, in, who here is using Azure actually? Let me ask that question. Uh, a few of you are. If you're not using Azure, you can sign up. Go to azure.com and there's a big green button that says... Uh, free trial. Go ahead and use that. Yep. And if you, uh, if you have MSDN, then you already have free Azure hours and you can start, uh, you can just activate that and start using it. I encourage you to do that. MSDN is, is um, if you're working for, who here has MSDN? A bunch of people do. So if you have MSDN and you're not using Azure today, go ahead and activate it. You get up to 150 US dollars per month of Azure hours, and that's learning how to use HD Insight is a perfectly valid use for your MSDN license, even if your boss has, has bought the license for you. You're training yourself for the future. I would encourage that. So if you go to Azure and go to the Azure portal, then uh, you'll see a big green plus button on the top left. That's how you create resources. Click that plus button and say, I want to create a new um, HD Insight service. And it'll ask you what kind of service, and you can select from this drop-down list here. And once you do it, and you, and you can select what operating system to use on. This, this surprised me that most of the servers in HD Insight are actually Linux servers. In fact, I think uh, the, the Windows servers are being deprecated. Now, the reason for that is because a lot of the work in Hadoop is being built on top of Linux. So you can actually deploy your, your solution to Linux. And then it'll ask you questions about how many servers in the cluster and what's, what size of clusters do you want to use, or what size of machines do you want to use, uh, where do you want to store this data, what region is it going to be in, and so on. That's one way to do it, is using the portal. Just a few clicks and you'll get it. Uh, the other way to do it is you can write scripts. You can write PowerShell scripts, or you can write CLI scripts, and scripts can take this a template like this, this JSON template, which will answer all those questions for you. And this is really a nice way to do it. It's even faster, just run a script and you can repeatedly create your clusters. Uh, I'll show you how to do this. So if I, can we see the screen? Yes, good. Open up a web browser and I'll go to uh, portal, oops. Hello. Portal.azure.com. Actually, I, you know what? I'll better, I better start a little bit further back. I'll go to Azure. I always say Azure.com because it's easier to remember, but that will redirect me to Azure.Microsoft.com. Oh, I hope I've got some Wi-Fi. Oops. Ah, good. And here, here's the, the big green free trial button that I talked about. Um, I've already got a, uh, like an account. So I'm going to go to the portal, and that'll take me to portal.microsoft.com. I'm sorry, portal.azure.com. And here is the portal, and here's the big green plus button that I told you about earlier. This is how we create any resource in the Azure portal. If I click on that, it'll bring up a list of categories of Azure services, and there are many, many Azure services. This one happens to be under data and analytics and it's HD Insight. If I didn't know that, there's a search box here. I could just type in HD Insight it would, and it would find it that way as well. I'll select that and this little wizard will walk me through it. It'll say, well, I need a name for this cluster. It must be a unique name among 
Azure HD Insight cluster just because it's going to have a, a public URL, HTTP colon something dot Azure HD Insight dot net. Uh, so I'll, I'll name it DG test. I always name my demos DG, which are my initials followed by test. And um, I'll say uh, UY. So you know, it's this one. And um, it's this subscription uh, cluster type right here is where I, I specify do I want a Hadoop cluster or an HBase cluster, et cetera. I'll select Hadoop. I can say Windows. In this case, Windows st is still supported, but it's, um, uh, it's going away. It's telling me that it's deprecated. So I'm encouraged to select Linux. Kind of surprising that wouldn't have happened five years ago at Microsoft, but that's, that's the new Microsoft. Um, I can tell what it, whether it's premium or standard. The premium co costs more, but uh, the uh, standard is, I mean, the premium has more features, but the standard is cheaper. I'm a cheapskate, so I'll say standard right here. Um, by default, the login name will be admin. I could change that if I wanted to. I'll give it a password. P-A-S-S-W-O. -S I'm going to say that loud, am I? Um, and then this is the, uh, the way we connect to, uh, we remotely connect to a server, a Linux server is through SSH. If it were Windows, I would use remote desktop. Can you guys see that in the back okay? Way in the back, shout out. Yes? Okay, good. All right, so here, um, uh, so I specify the name and the cluster type. Username, password, uh, this is the login name, this is the SSH name. Uh, SSH is a lot like remote desktop, only for Linux. Um, I specify a resource group, and I, I can create a brand new one here. Resource groups are just a way of managing a bunch of resources in Azure together. So if I wanted to delete them together or move them together or deploy them together, I can. And I'll call this one DG test UYRG, right that. Specify the location where I want it to, to put this cluster. And it'll list the, the clusters that are available. I think the nearest one is Brazil South, right here. And if I, if I filled it all right, all out correctly, then this next button will be enabled. I'll come to here. And then it says, where do I want to store my configuration information? And I'll give it an Azure storage account. And that'll be the storage account that contains Azure blob storage. Right here. There we go. Um, and right here, and I can create a brand new one, say, I'll call it DG test UI store. Uh, Azure blob storage has a concept of containers, which are uh, a lot like folders in a file system. They're just logical containers to, for storing blobs. And since the folders are a uh, logical container for storing files, and I'll give that a name so I can find it. Um, I call it DG test, it's fine, whatever. And then I click next. You gotta click it really hard, there we go. Okay, and then a summary pops up right here, and here I can change things. So one thing, sometimes I change for demos, I say the cluster size would be this size, maybe I wanna make it a little smaller, maybe I wanna make it a little bigger, I can actually change that to two if I want it to be a little cheaper. It'll tell me, you can see down here the cost. For, for two worker nodes, it would be uh, $4.68 an hour. If I want to go up to eight worker nodes, it'll be more than that. So um, there's a, the cost is proportional to the number of nodes in here. And I click Next on here. And then, let's see, if I want to add a, uh, run some scripts, I can add it here. If I wanted to add, some, add it to a virtual network, I can do that. Next. Here, there's a summary again. I can install applications, etc. And then clicking on create would actually create it. Now, for this demo, I am not going to click create. And the reason is because it takes about 20 minutes to actually run this, uh, uh, to actually create the cluster. And I only have about 20 minutes left in my presentation. So it wouldn't be any point to that. Um, and I've already created some in advance, which I'll show you in a few minutes. But that's how you do it. That's just a few clicks. And even with me talking, it only took five minutes to go through that. So I'm going to cancel that. And go back to my slides. There. And talk about some of the, the, the tools inside of HD Insight. Uh, one of them is Storm. Uh, Storm is a workflow engine uh, for doing real-time processing of data. It's really useful for if you're doing IoT 
applications and you've got data coming in, lots of data coming in really rapidly from all over the world, maybe, maybe uh, shop floor uh, machine information, maybe moisture and temperature weather information from areas around the world, lots of data coming in, and you want to have it cleaned up and stored somewhere and queried and checked for uh, uh, maybe high values or low values, and send out alerts, workflow like that. Um, it's good to talk about some of the terminology in Apache Storm. Uh, a stream, or a topology is actually an entire workflow. The stream is the data that flows through the workflow. Uh, a tuple is just a single set of data that moves from one workflow component to another. The spout is the first, work, first workflow component that actually accepts the data and kicks off the workflow. And a bolt are all of the individual components that um, do one discrete piece, piece of work. What you want to do when you're building workflow components is keep these bolts as simple as possible. So they're easily testable, um, and if an error occurs, it's easy to find out what exactly happened in there. Now you can run them in parallel, and you can run multiple things simultaneously, but keep them small and keep them simple. So here's a picture of uh, data right here of a tuple, which is data that comes in. It flows to the spout. The spout then decides which bolt to send it to. <clears throat> that bolt will do some operation. Maybe it's looking up data or cleaning up data or storing it somewhere or whatever. It'll send off to the next bolt. Um, the data that, and it can send up to multiple bolts. These things can run in parallel. The data that comes into a bolt doesn't have to be the same data that goes out of the bolt. You can configure that with your code. And that whole process is known as a stream. All right, in this event source, it could be a web service. It could be a, uh, an IoT event hub. Uh, it could be a, a, a trigger in a database. Anything that's going to kick off this topology. Um, for Storm, I'm going to skip the Storm demo in the interest of time and talk about HBase. Um, so HBase is a NoSQL database. Uh, anybody here working with uh, SQL Server? Lots, almost every hand just went up. So uh, it's a .NET conference. Uh, when I was getting started learning Microsoft technology, I learned about databases, and the first thing I learned about was relational databases. SQL Server was one of the first ones. Uh, there's a trend in the industry now to look, start looking at NoSQL databases. Uh, NoSQL databases, they're, they're, it's kind of a strange definition. They're, just, they're defined by what they're not. They are not SQL databases. They are not relational databases. <clears throat> so relational, or I'm sorry, NoSQL databases, they tend to have no enforced schema. So rather than it, with SQL Server, Whenever you, uh, when you set the database up, you define ahead of time the names of the columns, the size of the columns, the data types of each column. And if you make a mistake, if you accidentally misspell a column name, for example, or you accidentally try to store a string into a numeric column, it, it'll, it'll throw an exception. It'll tell you right away. It'll enforce that for you, which is kind of nice because you can catch errors a lot sooner that way. NoSQL databases do not do that. And in fact, HBase does not do that. Uh, also, if you have multiple tables in a relational database and you try to delete a parent table that has a related child, um, relational, database, relational databases will stop you from doing that. They will enforce that referential integrity. HBase and most other NoSQL databases will not do that. So you may ask yourself, why on earth would I sacrifice these really nice features of a database um, why wouldn't I just use something like a relational database? And the answer is speed and scalability. Because HBase doesn't have to do that work, it can run a lot faster. When you insert a row into an HBase database, then it doesn't have to do this referential integrity checking. It doesn't have to do this data type checking. It doesn't have to do the, the you know, making sure this everything's spelled correctly. It assumes you've already checked that, and it'll just store the data for you. Um, and that's really the big reason. And also the same thing with scalability. Because it doesn't have those hindrances, those, the extra work it has to do, it can scale out to uh, petabytes of data, huge amounts of data. Um, there's a set of commands for working with HBase. They tend to be, uh, there's a REST API for it, but create, get, put, and scan. Create is to create, this will do exactly what you'd think they would do. They would create a row, or get a row, or update a row, or scan through multiple rows, or you know, delete rows. And you can do this, there's a shell that you can use that's on the server, there's a REST API, there's even a C Sharp a library that just wraps the REST API that you can use. Here's a little picture of HBase. One of the th kind of quirky things about HBase is it uses column families. So rather than having um, 
uh, just a single column to store data, you may specify a column family, and every time you add or you update a row, what tends to happen is rather than changing a value, it'll just add another column to a column family. So in this case, I've got a column family called A that has A1, A2, A3, A4, and those might be, uh, imagine taking temperature readings of a machine on a shop floor every uh, two minutes, and rather than going back and editing something, we would just add another A5 next time the reading came in. In fact, here's something right here. Okay, so the column family temperature would be temperature one, temp two, temp three, temp four, and pressure and a average temperature. So this, this makes it a little bit harder to do aggregation. So a lot of times what designers of HBase database will do is they'll calculate the aggregated things like sum and average. They'll calculate that on the fly and store that with the data. All right, uh, and I do have a demo of HBase here, which I'll show to you. Let's see, I've got a server, let's see, in my resource group. I think I do, DG test. Right there. Uh, you know what, actually, I think I put it on my desktop. Here, uh, here we go, so here's my HBase cluster right here. And if I go to, okay, so it, right here I can, uh, it's called DG test HBase. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to remotely connect to this. When I created this one, I, I created an SSH user and I gave it a password. And I'm going to use SSH. There's a tool called Putty, which is um, the, a, a graphical tool for connecting to Linux servers via, via SSH. And I've installed that. So, oops, Putty is right here, and I'm going to connect to it. I have my notes right here. Where's my demo HBase right here? Uh, is uh, the same as this. SSH user at something right here. So connect to this. And the cluster name is what I call it, DG test HBase, I think. See if that works. And it's telling me that I don't recognize the certificate, and I'll say I don't care. I just created this a few minutes ago. I'll log in with my password. There, and that worked. And then uh, now I've got a command line prompt. I'm actually running on this Linux server, and I better bump up the, bump up, oops, I don't want to do that. Well, how do I get on? Darn it. How do I get a full screen on this? How about like that? Oh. Uh, I know, I'll close it. I'll connect again. That's <laughs> the only way I know. Putty. There, oops, grab that here. And right here I have, uh, what I call it, uh, DG test um, H base. Right there, and I wanted to bump the font up, that's all I wanted to do. And I think that's in here somewhere. Change settings. Um, appearance, no. Logging keyboard, bell features, behavior, selection, no. Where's my uh, cancel? Anybody know how to bump the font up on this? Duplicate, save, change, copy, reset, full screen, help. No, it's got to be right here. Uh, I think there's a way, to, isn't there a way to bump up the font? Appearance. Here, oh, right here, change. And how about right there? Apply. Ah, there we go. Okay, um, so what I want to do is I'm in HBase, so I can do things like uh, 
Uh, I'll, these are my cheat sheets here. So I can do uh, H base shell. And that brings up the H base shell. So I can create add input commands. Come on. There we go. And like, for example, tell me what version of H base am I using? Oh, there it is 1.1.2.2. .1 the status of my server right now. I don't have much on it here, but I've got one I decided to create with uh, two backup masters. And uh, let's uh, create something like this. The create command. I'll create a table called timing events with a column family of T. And there it is. Now it's, it's available here. And if I want to describe it, I want to take a look at this right here. Then it'll tell me information about that table. It's only got, it's got uh, one row here. Um, and now I can insert, I can add a row. To the timing events table, give it an ID of zero, 01. It'll be uh, column family T with uh, the column will be T colon one and the value will be one, two, three, four, five. And I could do that multiple times. I can say one, two, three, four, or backspace, backspace. One, two, three, four, six. How about that? And one, two, three, four, seven. So I can add it three times. It looks like I'm actually adding three rows, but I'm actually all I'm doing is updating the same row. Here. And I can see that as I say uh, scan. Timing events. Quote A. Oops. Come on. Enter. And oh, in this situation, and I've spelled something wrong here. Um, that's why I wanted to use my notes here. Uh, let's do this. Count right here. Oh, no, no. Well, row key was the ID. So it shouldn't be A. It should be, what was my row key again? It was uh, um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Should tell me that one right here. Uh, and, oh, I spelled it wrong again. Sorry. Um, let's see. Just go back to here. And I just want to do this. Count the number of rows. So count the number of rows here, and it'll tell me that I have one row in here. So what's happening is I've only, uh, I haven't, it looks like I've inserted three rows. I've actually been adding columns to the column family of this, the first row. And let's see, this one right here will get, get is what I want. And that'll return that one row. Enter. There we go. Uh, and where is it here? System C timeline. Here it is, right up here. Ta -ta -ta. I've lost it. One row in 60 seconds. Error, error, wrong of Argus. What did I do wrong? What? Get timing events one. Okay. All right, I'm gonna, I'll skip this one here. I've made a mistake. Let's move on to, back to the slides. I want to show the rest of these tools. Uh, Hive. Hive is a querying language that uh, allows you to query HBase data or SQL Server data, or any, any relational or non-relational database you can use with Hive. It's really useful in data warehouse systems, um, and it ships with its own querying language where you can write uh, user-defined functions. Um, these tend to be run as batch processes because when you're dealing with lots and lots of data, they tend to run, they tend to take a long time to run, but you can run them overnight and have reports that come out in the morning or maybe populate data warehouses that you can then query in the morning with tools like Excel or Power BI. Um, if you've worked with SQL Server in the past, this language should look familiar to you. It's pretty close to SQL, but it's designed to work with both relational and non-relational databases. And, oh, and I actually have a demo of this. In this case, what I'm going to do is I've created another server or another cluster 
called DG test uh, Hadoop right here. And this one, I can get connected to it, that with putty. With putty. And I will give it that same... Right here. SH user at cluster name dot something. And this, in this case, the cluster name is... DG test... Hadoop, right here. There's my password. I've logged that in. And from here, I could do things like creating tables. Here's my cheat sheet. Well, first, I want to go into Hive, right here. And while that's still going on, I'll, I'll bump up the font. Settings, appearance, change font. Right there, apply. All right. Uh, are we good? Oh, that's not right, is it? There we go. Um, so what I want to do here is drop table log4j logs. I don't think a table exists, but just in case, I'm going to drop it. Uh, it failed because it can't SSH use your cluster name. Where am I? Uh, I typed something in wrong. I think I connected to the wrong server. Let me try that again. Putty right here, and I want to connect to this right here. But not this one. I want it to be get rid of cluster name and change that to DG test Hadoop. There we go. Password here. Uh, misspelled P. Here. Welcome. Type in Hive. And from here, I want to say uh, settings. Again, I wish I would remember this. Appearance, change, bump that up. OK. Apply. All right, okay, now I'm in Hive right here, and this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to say, uh, let's drop this table right here. You right-click is how you paste into this. And it uh, looks like I did drop that table, but I'm going to recreate it. I'm going to create an external table right here, and I'm going to point it to an example data. So this example data actually ships whenever I create a new cluster, a new Hive cl or Hadoop cluster, it automatically will have this example data in Azure storage. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a table that maps to that, that points to that table here. Um, and uh, then I'll select some rows from it here. In fact, I'm, only not, I'm not going to select all rows from it. I'm only going to select those rows where T4 equals error. So this one has a lot of information in it. But if I want to do one, oops, control C, and then paste. There we go. That's what I want to do. No, that's not what I do. Hang on. Yeah, there we go. Select. Yeah. T4. Enter. Go. Here it is. And so now I've selected some rows here. Running, initiated, keep going. Still thinking. And here we go. So we're it's it's wrapping here inconveniently, but you can see that there's some rows that are just being returned in here, and, all right. Um, 
All right, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to, this one actually is just a, a pointer. This table doesn't actually contain the data. It's just pointing to this data over here. What this is going to do is it's actually going to create a new table. with the same columns in it, T1, T2, T3, et cetera. And in here, I'm actually going to insert some rows into it. So this, is an, this will make an actual copy of the data. It's not pointing to anything. And I've inserted three rows into it. And here I can look at those three rows that I've inserted. You can see that this looks a lot like SQL. And there's the three rows. There's T1, T2, T3. T4 equals error in every one because that was a filter that I did originally. And uh, outputting the rows here. So you can do this interactively with the command line or you can create batch file, you can create script files to do the same thing. And I've done that here. I've got a few, a couple of script files to do uh, map reduce. What map reduce will do is it'll, um, the, uh, it's a common thing in big data, the mapping will do filtering and sorting, and the reduce calculates aggregate functions for that. And so what we have here are uh, some tools in here. Let's see, I think I did this already. Hadoop, Um, right here, right there. So this is going to run a map reduce file right here, and it's a, uh, a a word count. So it'll look at a file and count the number of words in it. If you look at it, it's a the file that's input into it is somewhere in here. It's DaVinci.txt. It's a bunch of text from Leonardo da Vinci and it'll go through and it'll count all of the words and it will output them into a file called word count and right here I can actually see that word count file you can see a list up here uh, loop chart did I not do that wrong one copy It's running slowly. Come on. Escape. Let me just do that and let it error. I may have lost my connection. There we go. So let's try that again. And it is not outputting anything, so it's not doing what I expected it to do. Um, I did that. I did that earlier. I think I did this. Let me try this really quickly. Make sure that I converted DOS to Unix. I may have skipped that step. Let's do that. And if it doesn't work this one time, I'm going to just stop. So Hadoop jar will install. We'll run this program. Right here. Oh, I know why it's not working. It's because I'm still in Hive. I need to exit Hive. There, oh, <laughs> ah! All right, so I was in Hive when I was trying to execute those commands. That's, that's what I was, I was doing. I needed to exit back to the Linux command prompt and then get it done. If I have time, I'll come back to that demo. Um, let me just finish up the rest of these slides and I'll show you one last demo. It is here. I want to talk about Spark, and Spark is just a general purpose compute engine that ships with HD inside. It is part of Hadoop. Um, 
And with that, you could do pretty much anything. You write any, any programs you want. Typically, they're written in either Scala, Python, or R, which are languages that are really popular in the data science world. Uh, one really nice thing for them is, uh, is it to hosting Jupyter Notebooks. And Jupyter Notebooks are a little bit like Google Docs for data. They contain mixtures of text and executable code so that you can have reports that describe the report and then the data from that report. Or maybe if you have unit tests, you might want to uh, uh, have descriptions of the test and then the output of those tests in line with one another. Um, it can integrate with tools like uh, with all sorts of libraries to doing graphing and doing querying and uh, all sorts of things, uh, to, uh, Power BI tools or visualization tools, and it supports Jupyter Notebooks. So let me show you that. I have here a server called uh, DG Test Spark right here, and in DG Test Spark, when I create the cluster, it actually ships with a few Jupyter Notebooks, which I can show you right there, Jupyter Notebooks. And these notebooks are really nice because they are a tutorial that'll teach you how to use Jupyter Notebooks. So the executable code is just simple commands, and above it is explanations of those commands. If I want to log in, I'll log in with admin, which is one of the questions it asked me when I created the cluster. Okay, and oh. I typed it in wrong. Let me go to a in private window here, and again do portal.azure.com. And Oh, okay. Is that this one? Ah, good. One thing I haven't figured out how to get around is when I mistype my credentials, it caches them. It doesn't give me the chance to correct it. So I'm going to go back to here and open up Spark again in an in-private window. And I'll go to the cluster dashboard and click on Jupyter Notebooks. And this time I'll be really careful about the password I type in. And there we go. And you can see under PySpark right here, these are the tool. These are the uh, Jupyter notebooks that are that ship with this. So if I can, if I open one of them up, I can see a nice tutorial right here that'll walk me through. So even if I'm not familiar with Python, which is the language that Jupyter notebooks are using, which is why it's spelled like this, Jupyter. Um, then, as I said, th walk through this thing here, for example, here's the help command. So each one of these, these gray boxes is, a, is one or more commands, and you notice there's a blank box next to it. I can run this by clicking on that, and in this case, this command just out outputs a bunch of help. Uh, here's one for info about the cluster. I can run that. Also, Shift-Enter will do that. This one down here, I'll do some configuration. So I'll do shift enter this time to show that. And you notice it briefly showed it as a star in this box. This one's actually going to bring in some uh, SQL functionality and run a SQL select statement against it. You notice it shows as a star. It actually takes a little bit of time because it has to start the Spark application. So that might take about 60 seconds or so. And while that's running, you'll see this is a star. And up in the top here, you'll notice it says busy up here. And you'll know that it's done because this star will then change to a number, in this case it'll be number four, to indicate this fourth one that's done, and then we'll start to see some output here. So the output has started, but it's not quite done yet, so which is why it still says star. And if you go through this, it'll actually explain exactly what's going on here, which is kind of nice. I'll wait till that's done, because I think the next one builds on that. 
Come on. And this is using this hive sample table, which the cluster just automatically creates for us. Um, so you can do run, just practice your SQL skills on this. Almost done. It's starting to format it here. Bringing back some data. What did this say? Collect these uh, client ID, query time, device. I think this is information about uh, mobile devices. And I only want those that are in the state of Washington and that are made by Microsoft. All right. I don't know if you know this, Microsoft actually. It's no secret that Microsoft has a mobile phone, a smartphone, but sometimes it seems like it is. That was a joke. <laughs> All right, so here, here's the output. And you notice also this, this output, by default, it shows in this table format. But if I want to see it in another format, like a scatter diagram, I could just click on one of these and see that same data in a different format, in some visualization. There's a pie chart. I don't know if the pie chart will work here because, um, first, I'm not a fan of pie charts. But also, the, uh, when it starts to get really lots and lots of data here, it becomes meaningless. It's hard to figure out what that really even means. And in fact, after it gets a certain number, it'll refuse to even create a pie chart. Uh, and on here. So stepping through here allows you to work through some of these Jupyter Notebook, I'm sorry, sorry, but these commands here, select star from hive sample table and run locally, etc. Um, and if you have your own Jupyter Notebooks, then you can actually add those, go back into here, and I'll go back to the home. And if I want to add my own Jupyter Notebooks right here, upload, and from here I can upload my, um, oops, I can upload my own Jupyter Notebooks, right, which I have in my Dropbox, presentations, HD Insight, resources, Spark. I can grab these and just bring them up and upload these. Into here, and they'll just appear here, and I can start using those as well. Um, so uh, that's those are the demos that I have. This has been an overview of the tools in HD Insight. Uh, a couple things that you really want to keep in mind: a when you're creating clusters of computers, the more computers you create, the more expensive they are. And if you leave these things running for a long time. $4 an hour doesn't seem like a lot, but if you leave that running for 24 hours or a week, it can add up a lot. So you want to make sure you delete these clusters when you're done with them, when you're done working with them. Um, and uh, because you, you just shutting them down is enough. There's no suspend state. You have to delete them. When you delete them, all the configuration will stay in Azure storage. So you're, you're safe that way. You can create them later. Um, but, uh, and this is typically what you'll do if you have jobs that run every night or every other day, every Friday, then you'll create these clusters right before you run the jobs. And that's a good reason for scripting these things, using PowerShell or using CLI to script them. There's a couple of links here. My slides are right here, so you can just take a look at that there. And then there's some labs on HDN site at this repository right here that we do for colleges. If you want to take a picture of that, you can. And uh, if you want to get started, just go to azure.com. I think I'm over time, but I thank you for your interest. My name is David. Have a great conference.